one thing that the audience can realize is that fear is only here to help us. It is a performance enhancer, period. Jumbo! You might be smarter, your daddy might own a company, but you will not outwork me. This one right here is for the people. In this safe shop city. Don't stop, no, don't quit. Yeah. You know who this kid is, he's from Chicago. I'm your host, Ryan J. Owens, current pro athlete, entrepreneur, and former USA national team volleyball player. I will not be defined by my athleticism alone, but I've learned how to leverage it, to stay passionate about it, and prepare for life. That's why the Beyond Athletic podcast was born. I'll bring you case studies of current and former elite athletes making it happen in life, as well as tips and lessons from top sources in sports, nutrition, fitness, entrepreneurship, and more. I'm here to tell you that you are beyond athletic. Hey, hey, you all. Welcome back. If it's your first episode, hope you enjoy it. If you do, feel free always to share it however you like. Leave a review about this episode or any of the others. This guest in this episode is all about fear. I love what we get into here. It was so good that we're actually going to have a follow-up episode talking about how to get into a state of flow. And who better to learn that from than somebody whose sport is every second that she's doing something on a big mountain, skiing, doing flips, being heli dropped into these extreme situations. She's risking her life. She was called fearless by many people. And after all, of course, we all have fear. And what's very interesting is that we get into how we should go about fear, understanding it, using it to actually excel. I love that this is kind of like turning everything on its head in terms of everything that I had heard in the past from coaches and peers and anybody really outside of sport. I'm always looking for advice on how I can be better, you know, how I can optimize myself, my life, my skills. So anyways, I believe you're going to love this show. If you do, please leave a comment wherever you found this, share it with a friend, leave a review on iTunes or anywhere you can. It shows support. It helps us get out there. We want more athletes to hear this show. When I say we, I mean myself doing this show, recording it producing it, pushing it out there, but also all of the friends that I have that really kind of fire me up to keep doing this, whether that's the mentors that I have with Beyond Athletic Mentors or anyone out there that listens to the show and just throws me some kind of comment. It's really enough for me to just keep going. So thank you so much for the support so far. I hope you enjoy this episode. Remember, there's going to be a follow-up episode about how to get into flow. And if you want to know more about flow, head back to the last episode, beyondathletic.com forward slash 58, and you will hear an episode with Stephen Kotler, author of The Rise of Superman. So without any further ado, enjoy and be more. Hey there, Kristen. How are you? Welcome to the show. Hi, Ryan J. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Loving uh, this whole little hiatus I have in Athens right now. Where are you? In Salt Lake City. I'm about to leave for Burning Man. Ooh, so exciting. <laughs> I've heard so much about it. I got to go sometime. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for being on the show. Uh, what I think you're going to bring to the table is something that we've actually never directly addressed on the podcast. And I know I deal a lot with it <laughs> internally, but also uh, with our athletes that I work with through the mentorship and through my agency. And so, I mean, I'd like to just hear a little bit of your background from you about like put us into what type of athlete you were, how you approached your sport, how you maybe got into your sport, just so that some of these things might resonate with athletes as we go into the topics that you're going to talk about. Okay, so my unique training turning me into a fear and anxiety expert is this um, kind of threefold. I used to be a professional athlete. I also have voraciously studied a Zen approach to fear, and I've worked with tens of thousands of clients now, most of them athletes. So backing up to my athletic career, which is a major part of my education, and I actually realize now that the whole reason why I was a professional athlete was so that I could bring this unique message about what to do about fear and anxiety. Um, 
my athletic career though was kind of extraordinary. I was the best in the world at my sport for 12 years, which is very unusual. Um, my sport was professional big mountain extreme skiing. And the word extreme means risking your life. Like if you're on a pair of skis and you're skiing a groomed run, that's not extreme skiing. But if you're on a pair of skis and you're skiing a you fall, you die descent, you know, where the consequences of failure are death, that's extreme skiing. So that's what I did. I, I made a lot of ski movies. Um, it wasn't really a competitive thing. Like I did a couple competitions, but the wannabes are the ones that compete. And once you actually win the competitions, then you get a chance to film movies, ski movies. And so I was a ski film star. And um, I was also really into a lot of other dangerous sports like ice climbing, rock climbing, kiteboarding, paragliding. Um, I rode my bike alone across India, things like that, huh. um, ski mountaineering. And I was actually voted by the outdoor industry to be the most fearless woman athlete in North America, beating women in all sports disciplines. So I have this really unique background of being fearless, being called fearless. I felt fearless and I put quotes up because um, nobody's fearless. And I believe my own hype. It actually wasn't true. And so I've kind of devoted my life to kind of picking apart what I did right by fear, what I did wrong by fear during my athletic career to come up with the unique concepts and ideas that I'm going to share with you guys during this podcast. Love it. That is uh, super exciting. And I think it's fun because we're going back to back episodes where we're talking about extreme sports. And uh, that topic for me is just so close to home because like I mentioned to you, I'm, I was just a geek for anything that I could get hurt doing, I loved. I don't know why. I think it was just so fun to push myself when I was younger, whether it was like the first thing was the, the skates, the old school skates, so right, <laughs> not the inline, and then moving to inline, then moving to skateboarding, then moving to snowboarding, and, and then to mountain bike trials, and, and understanding that fear is very real, very real, and like, I can't, I can, I can actually imagine what you did. I can't see myself doing it other than that little cartoon I could play in my mind. It's just like, I think sometimes you're, you're so, I've been, I've been reading a lot. I'm jumping around here, but I've been reading a lot about emotional intelligence. And it's so funny because it's talking about how the brain has this, this, uh, actually it's not even a cognitive function. It's, you're not thinking you're reacting. And it's like the oldest part of our brain that actually kind of makes us, it's like the, I see this or, I, or I'm taking this in, I'm hearing this or I'm seeing this, react this way. And it's like programmed to be that way. And I think it's funny because most of the extreme athletes I know or the athletes that I know that take the, the bigger risks, let's say in their sports, they have almost programmed that over time and so I'm hoping that we're going to get into a lot of that. And I'm really excited about your background. Sometime we're going to have to talk about that maybe on another show, really get into your history. That'd be really cool for the skiers and the extreme athletes, but also athletes like myself now in volleyball. So tell us more about the art of fear. Um, what, what made you write that and, and what's it all about? Well, before I answer that, I want to reflect on um, some things that you just outlined. Like, why is it important to talk about fear? And mind you, anxiety is fear. We just have stopped calling it fear. Now we call it anxiety for some reason. I think that fear has a stigma around it. Anxiety is a little different in that it's recirculating fear, <clears throat> maybe when there's no longer a perceived threat. The reason why it's important for us to talk about it is because, as you mentioned, we have this part of our brain called the amygdala two almond-shaped nuggets at the top of the spine, determining safe or not safe. And it's the manufacturing plant for fear. And if there's a perceived threat, then it'll manufacture fear um, and send it as a feeling of discomfort into our bodies. So we get the impression that fear is something in our heads, but actually it's a feeling in our bodies. And this has been scientifically proven, like the feeling comes first. But uh, the thing is, all data is run through this primary filter first called the amygdala. And to the amygdala, everything is a perceived threat. And even if you're not an athlete, even if you never leave the house, you still have fear every single moment of every single day in nearly every single interaction you have. If you also decide to become an athlete, 
you know, and you're putting yourself out there, especially if you're a competitive athlete, fear of failure, fear of rejection, it gets to be even bigger. Um, and then if you're an extreme athlete and there's the fear of death and like, if I don't make this turn, I'm going to die, you know, that adds a whole nother component to it. And so, um, in today's world too, with so much data and input coming in just in our lives in general and so much competition at this point, the amygdala is manufacturing fear so fast, you know, in my book, I joke faster than Joey chestnut eats a hot dog. <laughs> so mm -hmm. We have fear with us every moment of every single day and nearly every interaction we have. And so if we don't have a healthy, inclusive relationship with that fear, then we're in denial of it. Um, it's, I would think that it's the most important personal work you can do as an individual is to learn how to have a healthy relationship with that core primary emotion that is such a huge part of our lives. And if you're an athlete and if you're trying to resist that fear or try to conquer or overcome it, or put it out of your mind or visualize it away or breathe it away or let it go or any of the number of things that we're taught to do, that's not the way that you should be dealing with fear because whatever you resist persists. And that's why I wrote the book on fear because um, I realized that it's not helping us. The things that we're taught to do about fear are not helping us, they're only hurting us. No, I love that. You touched on a few things. Uh, first of all, amygdala is a Greek word. I'm in Greece, that's cool, that's fun. But, uh, and it really does mean almond <laughs> because they are almond shaped. Uh, and then the other thing that I actually read today is that from the moment you hear or see this thing that's going to give you that emotion, emotional response, right? The amygdala is going to register that uh, is the moment it tells your, oh my gosh, what's the other thing? The oldest part, it's actually one of the first things developed to develop when we're babies. Limbic? Well, it's the limbic system, right? But there's the, the underlying, ah, it's 12, 12 thousandths of a second is the time it takes for that seeing or hearing something for the emotional response. And it takes twice as long for that to actually go to our neocortex, right? So we can think about what do we actually do, not what, what are we pre-programmed to do? I think that's wild to think about that like so fast and you see people react first and then you're like why'd you react like that and i don't know i just you know i think that's so interesting that you're talking about that um when you when you're when you're in the book and you're talking about the art fear and you're talking about you know uh things like what we resist persists how do we embrace fear how do we go about these things like what's What's an athlete to do if they're in those moments or actually let's step back from that. How would you start to prepare? Because you know what fear feels like, right? You know what the situations are. Well, when an athlete comes to me, if they're having some sort of flow issue or if they're having too much anxiety or too much fear of failure, or they feel like there's something off in their undercurrent that they know is holding them back, the first thing I do is look to what is their relationship with fear. So the best thing that an athlete can do is first have some sort of awareness of what that relationship is. It used to be said that knowledge is power, but whoever said that said that in the late 1400s when we also believed the world was flat. It's actually not relevant in today's world, especially with Google, like knowledge is at your fingertips. What is more relevant in today's world is awareness is power. Because if you have some sort of awareness about what's going on in your undercurrent, in your relationship with fear, then you have the power to change that. Um, so I start with just awareness, like what is my relationship with fear? And there are four distinct ways I see athletes or people in general deal with fear. And I'm gonna rank them from worst way to deal with fear to best way to deal with fear. Awesome. And during my ski career, I did the worst possible way to deal with fear and I also did the best possible. So the first level, I'm gonna call them levels. Okay. Worst possible way to deal with fear is to resist it. And the word resistance is my word, but don't get too caught up on that word. There are so many different ways to resist fear, as many ways as there are people. Some people uh, try to fight it, conquer it, overcome it. Some people ignore it. I was really good at ignoring fear back then, which is why I felt fearless. It wasn't true. Um, other people are in their heads so much uh, because they don't wanna have to deal with the feelings in their body. That's one way to not deal with fear. 
and the list goes on and on. And most of the tips and techniques that were taught by coaches, well-meaning coaches, mind you, to deal with fear is to resist it, you know, to rationalize it away using our intellect, to do breathing exercises, to breathe it away, to um, uh, visualize, you know, like these meditation apps where you visualize calm, like success, all of that. And that is many different, there's many different forms of resistance and they're almost universally taught by every single self-help guru, psychologist, sports psychologist, and on and on. I do not recommend this. It is the worst thing that you can do because whatever you resist persists. And I kind of see it like, imagine fear being a child that has something to say. And here's this child kind of saying, hey, you know, you might want to be scared of this and you ignore it. You know, you put a plastic bag over its head, you lock it in the basement, throw away the key. It goes away and you think, well, that worked. All these methods are proven scientifically to work, but it's temporary. And you've now aggravated that child called fear. And it's only going to come back and stay longer and whine louder. And next thing you know, it, it takes twice as long to get rid of it until you have an anxiety problem. And then maybe it hijacks your mind maybe in the middle of the night when you're trying to sleep and it keeps you awake and you can't sleep anymore. And next thing you know, you have burnout because it's so exhausting to keep ignoring that fear or you become a really rigid, stoic person to not deal with it. Just the consequences of resisting fear are profound and you can only get away with it, I found, for about 10 years and then you're just things start to go wrong. And if you have a problem uh, in your performance or in your life, the repression or resistance of fear ha has either something to do with it or everything to do with it. So that's, that's the first level. Um, and it's culturally the norm. Yeah. And I just so kind of get very you normal. I mean, I, I hear I that all the time too. I'm going to ask any clarifying questions before I get to the other three levels. Yeah, no, I was saying, um, it's very, it's very common for those things. It's, uh, even if you're, I, I like how you explain, for instance, uh, you can resist in a few different ways. And the examples you gave are very good because one way can be trying, or it could be you trying to say, no, this doesn't exist or um, blah, 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 or trying to meditate that on that, that it's, you know, okay, it's there, but I'm going to say like, it's not there. There's always kind of like band-aids. I feel like that first level is all about. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm a big fan of meditation, but we've introduced goals to meditation here in the Western world. And so if it's goal oriented meditation, then it's just some form of resistance. Repression can also be the result. And it's just such a bad idea. And I'm sure that everybody's listening does this. You know, we all do it. I did it during my ski career. And it, it led to me having a tremendous amount of injuries. Um, I started being burnt out because I was spending all my energy blocking out fear. I also witnessed a lot of friends dying and I had probably over 50 near death experiences. And so because I wasn't dealing with the emotions from that, I developed PTSD. I started having sleep issues because that undealt with fear during the day was waking me up in the middle of the night. Um, other people may start having anxiety disorders or panic attacks or um, having really unpleasant anxiety before or in the middle of their performance to the point where they want to quit. Um, you know, we're at the point where we can even see gymnasts at age 17, they're already burnt out on their sport, probably because they're not dealing with their fear. Mm. So this is just a really bad idea. And, you know, the whole letting it go, it's the worst advice you could ever get about fear. So that's level one. And I used to do it and I really regret it. And I wish that I had my book to read back when I was an athlete, because then I wouldn't have had so many injuries. I wouldn't have had the burnout. I wouldn't have started hating my sport and I wouldn't have had the PTSD. So second level is that we learn how to accept the fear. Okay, fear is normal and natural. It's not a sign of personal weakness. Um, this is just part of the deal with being an athlete. The reason why this is only the second level, and, and definitely this is a step in the right direction, but we're still actually in our heads dealing with our emotions intellectually, like we're intellectualizing something. It's normal and natural. And it's kind of a little bit passive too. Like, I love to personify fear. So that child, you know, that you've been abusing and pushing away and not listening to and locking in the basement, okay, I accept you. You know, you're going to be a normal, natural part of my life. There's nothing I can do about you. It is what it is. 
it's not, you're not really having a, a close relationship with that child. It's still, it, it's not only passive, but it's um, accepting that the child is in your life is not what we're going for. That's not going to make the child fear, feel included in your life. The third level on how to deal with fear is that you learn how to embrace it. Mm. And that's when you shift from dealing with your emotion intellectually to dealing with your emotions emotionally. So that takes you into your body where you learn how to feel them. And it shifts you from your mind into your body if you're willing to feel your fear, which is a better place from which to perform athletically than your head. So as an athlete standing like at the top of a mountain and I'm about to do something that I'm risking my life, I could try and block the fear out. I could accept the fear, but then I could also embrace the fear. You do that and then all of a sudden you're in your body and you're having kind of, you're headed towards level four, which is having an intimate relationship with that fear where you're kind of like lovers in a dance. And next thing you know, fear actually turns from a hindrance into an asset, an ally, it becomes the very thing that uh, helps you bring your A game to what you're about to do, Help you, helps you be sharp and focused. Like if you have fear and if you're willing to embrace it, then the zone comes for free and it takes you there. And extreme sports are notorious for taking people into the zone. And the reason why is because these athletes are having an intimate relationship with the fear and the fear takes them there. It helps them perform better. Yeah, this is, uh, that's all fantastic i love it and it's uh kind of get, getting me excited about playing my sport again because now i've come to athens i'm trying to get back into volleyball because i took a little bit of a hiatus for work and you know when you come back into the sport i feel like there's this little bit of should i i shouldn't do this so quickly or will i make this mistake or things like that and I like that that hurdle was so much smaller this time, even though I'm, I'm not starting at an Olympic level, a national team level like I was playing before. It's still the same sport and you're still a, a human and you have these feelings, you know, and I was very proud of myself that I just kind of went, you know, I'm just going to go with it. Uh, it's there. I'm going to see how far I can go with this. I loved the talk um, in the last episode. So everything that you just mentioned, I think, really ties into some of the lessons that I talked with, with Stephen Cutler about, um, who's the author of The Rise of Superman, and what you're speaking about with athletes and, and why so often, or so much more often, they might get into this state of flow, right? Um, is because you are embracing it, because you are all of the things that you're intimate with the fear. And I think these lessons are, are huge. So if we were talking, to an athlete today and we're going to say here's how you can set up your kind of like your your habits to include some methods to try to get to those stages right to accept it to embrace it to be intimate with it how would you start that as an athlete like what's what's the first step in that direction maybe setting up your day in some ritual or something like that morning or night when I work with an athlete, I'm not a speaker. I don't give advice. What I do is I facilitate them and I take them on a journey into their undercurrent to uh, figure out what their unique relationship is with fear because everybody's so different and mm -hmm. we start there. And then whatever we find, then I give them a practice that pertains specifically to them. But here's what uh, the audience, because you know, I can't do that during this podcast. You know, It's a personal experience and it takes, you know, it takes about an hour. Um, one thing that the audience can realize is that fear is only here to help us. It is a performance enhancer, period. There's no such thing as good fear or bad fear. There's only fear. But if you deal with it in a healthy way, it'll be a performance enhancer. If you don't deal with it in a he healthy way, then it'll be a performance crusher. It's that simple. So fear is not the problem for us. It's our misguided relationship or reaction to the fear. So how you can go from having an unhealthy relationship with fear to having a healthy relationship with fear starts with first getting to know your unique relationship with fear. Um, 
why is it showing up the way it is? If it's showing up in an exaggerated way as anxiety or um, as lack of flow, or if you're underperforming and you're blaming fear, or if fear of failure or fear of rejection is causing problems for you, or if fear is showing up in your mind, it's the way that you've been treating fear that is causing that. And if you keep doing what you're doing, it's not going to work. It's only going to make it worse. It may give you some relief in the moment, but it's going to become harder and harder to do over time until eventually you quit your sport. So the practice would then be is you have to, like that fear that we typically avoid, that whining child, instead of turning away from it like we're taught or like we're used to, you actually turn towards it and start to have a conversation with it and start to embrace it, which is a physical thing, which is not a heady thing, um, start to do a dance with it, then things change and they change really, really fast. And it takes some effort, but it's a heck of a lot less effort than ignoring fear your entire life. Yeah. And the last thing I'll say um, is that I, I have a client, I actually just had a client yesterday who uh, wants to be a better skier. And he talked to a ski instructor once and he goes, what is it going to take me to be able to ski like you? And the instructor said, well, eight seasons, a hundred days a season. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, that's one way. But if somebody were to come to me and start off before they even take their first lesson in skiing and they cultivate a healthy relationship with fear, because skiing is a very scary sport, you know, if they just go into it, embracing their fear, having an intimate experience with fear, knowing that they're taking up skiing specifically because they want to feel fear, like that's, that's the gift. That's the reason why skiing is so fun. You know, we don't do it despite the fear. We do it because of the fear. You mm -hmm. know, if there was no fear in skiing, nobody would buy any lift tickets. You know, we're going there to have this kind of feeling of aliveness and excitement. Mm -hmm. Neurochemically, fear and excitement are exactly the same thing. So just by having that shift in understanding, you know, first of all, it's not going to take eight seasons and it's not going to take a hundred days a season. Like just having that intimate relationship with fear is going to make them get so much better so fast yeah. because most people that go skiing, they're, I call it in the back seat, like they're leaning back. It's because they're trying to get away from their fear. They're trying to resist gravity. They're trying to resist the unpleasantness that speed brings, which is the fear, you know, they're trying to go back to some sort of comfort zone and literally ski instructors will spend their entire careers just trying to get people forward. Lean well, that comes organically if you're embracing the fear and if you're embracing the rush and you're embracing gravity and all that comes with that gravity experience you know, you're just going to get so much better so fast. And it, it goes that way with any sport. It is the most important training you can do, even more so than physical or technical, to have a intimate relationship with your fear out there. Um, so to have that, though, is uh, learning how to feel it, learning how to embrace it, and starting a practice I call a fear practice. You know, not a love practice, not a joy practice, not a badass practice, but actually a fear practice. Build that foundation first. Yeah. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. I mean, it's pretty clear that if you're going to work on it, it's one of those things that you have to go through your day, through your trainings, using that with that approach, right? It's not something you throw into a routine in the morning or the night. It's something that you're actually living and doing. Uh, is that right? Yes, and your coach is not going to teach you this. Mm -hmm. This is very, very new. We're just starting to see this. You know, when I wrote my book, I started uh, cruising the internet to try and figure out if there's anybody else teaching this. I couldn't find anyone. Now we're starting to see it, though. And I've, uh, I just had a movie made about how I became a, a fear specialist called Voices of Fear. And I had the great honor and privilege of interviewing 27 professional extreme athletes Alex Honnold, who free soloed El Cap, I interviewed him for two hours only wow. about fear. I didn't ask him about how he got into climbing, none of that. All we did was talk about fear. I interviewed Laird Hamilton, you know, arguably the best big wave surfer in the world. And one by one by one, we all, and they didn't, they didn't know, they didn't know what their relationship was with fear, but we dissected it together. And it turns out all the great performers have an intimate relationship with fear. And here's the thing that I've noticed. The best in the world have an intimate relationship with fear. The second best in the world have a resistant approach to fear. 
Wow. So this is very new, and this is only starting to be talked about today. And this is the future for us all. And you're either on this train or you're not on this train, and you don't want to be left at the station. You know, we're starting to see in business too that the best uh, CEOs, um, you know, people that are making great change in the world, they also have an intimate relationship with fear. So. And that may have happened in the past, but we're only now starting to talk about it because people didn't know what their deal was. So the part of me that resisted fear caused a lot of problems for me. But the part of me that had an intimate relationship with fear, and it was a paradox. You know, my whole life was about fear and you can have a paradox. You know, like if you're married, right? You can both love and hate your spouse, right? It's yeah. the same with fear. So I both loved and hated fear, but the part of me that loved fear and had that intimate relationship, that's the part of me that became the best in the world. So um, it, it, is, it is a thing and it's, it's, uh, it has to happen because what's the definition of insanity? Yeah, doing the same, doing the same thing, thing, over thing over and over, over again, yeah. expecting different results. The reason why I figured this out and why it was on my mind is because in our culture, we're becoming just such an anxiety ridden culture, which is another name for fear. What we're doing is not working. And we keep coming up with new methods and modalities to fight fear, to conquer it, to overcome it. And they seem to help, but people are only starting to have more and more panic attacks, more and more anxiety disorders, more and more people are getting on sleep meds, more and more people are turning to opioids to medicate their fear away. Um, Depression is Latin for press down. If you press down your emotions like fear and anger and sadness, they become depressed. And so too do you. Like all of these emotional problems that we're starting to see as rampant in our society comes from the repression or resistance of fear. And we have to stop doing this because it's, it's killing all our souls, never mind athletes. But um, I always say that your relationship with fear is the most important relationship of your life because it's a relationship that you have with yourself at your core. So you want to make it the best possible so that you can be healthy emotionally, uh, physically, uh, spiritually, psychologically, mentally, on and on and on. So that's why I wrote this book. And that's why I really encourage people to have a fear practice. I love it. Thank you so much. Uh, I know you have to go. You've got to get the Burning Man. I do want to just ask you a couple quick questions before we finish up. And uh, hopefully I'll have you back on at some point. We can get more into things, but also your story as an athlete. I, I can only imagine what that's like. But uh, how can people follow you? How can they find you? What do we want to push them towards? Well, let's make it simple. Go to my website, kristenolmer.com. And uh, E-N-U-L-M-E-R with a K, Kristen Ulmer, and take my free fear and anxiety assessment to kind of help you dissect what your own unique relationship is with fear that is probably under your radar and you're not quite aware what it is. Love it. And everything else from her is going to be linked in the show notes. Uh, last question. The this, this show is called Beyond Athletic. The whole idea is kind of obvious, but I'd be interested in hearing from you um, as an athlete, what if there was any definition for being beyond athletic for you could be different for everybody. What would that be? You know, we credit the sport for giving us that amazing feeling, but really it's the sport is just the catalyst. Like I thought I was in love with skiing, but really I was in love with the places that it took me to that expanded place where like I'm beyond mind and body you know, into the zone, we call it flow, you know, the best chance that you have of getting there is to be in flow with all in, in Zen, my trainings in Zen are 10,000 states of being. And some of them are emotional, some of them are mental, physical states, spiritual, not to be confused with, with religion. Like this is an opportunity for us to tap into all 10,000 states of who we are, be in flow with them all. And you know, I, I think drop by drop, we become a mighty river. I see these um, as droplets of water, like here's fear, here's anger, here's sadness, here's joy, here's passion, here's frustration. You know, these are all droplets of water. And if we're in flow with all of them, we don't try to deny any of them their rightful place in our lives. They, 
when we think about droplets of water turning into rivers, it takes us to the ocean, it takes us into this amazing, huge expanded place. Um, and we think it's the sport that's taking us there, but we're the ones that are manifesting that, you know, and it's in us and the sport is just helping us access that. And uh, that's why sports are so amazing. And I will say that sports are the most common way in which people have an, a spiritual experience, you know, accessing that extra special place because um, like a spiritual experience is having some, a bigger experience than your own limited personal view of the world, like than your own ego. And, but it's the least discussed and the least understood. And I think by you having your podcast, we're starting to discuss this and we're starting to understand this. So thank you. Thank you so much. One of the best definitions I've heard so far. I love it. It was yours. And um, I hope to have you back on the show. Uh, the Art of Fear. Go pick up that book. Yes. Check it out. Let us know what you think. Yeah. Thanks so it much. It explains Kristen. everything. <laughs> We're definitely gonna have to get into it more. I would love it. And the Zen part of everything is just, uh, for me, all of this is so interesting. So I hope to have you on again. It would be my honor. Thank you. Love, 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 love it. Go check out kristenolmer.com. Do her free fear and anxiety assessment. I checked it out. I did it. I think I got a 51 out of 100 and really enjoyed going through those things and, and it was hard a little bit of it trying to okay gauge where or how am I with these things and it made me think a lot about it of course as you heard in the episode I mean I'm reading a book right now um, it's called uh, emotional intelligence and I really 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 enjoy this book and this topic for me is so wildly appropriate because for so long in my life I just tried to avoid nerves run away from them push them down do anything to get them out of my mind and really just try to forget about it or ignore them and it never worked if it worked for a moment it worked for a moment but really they were still there and I wish that I had learned how to deal with them earlier and so at this point in my life I've decided to dedicate these moments and going forward to how do I get my emotional quotient up how do I improve myself in these ways right if you enjoyed this episode as always leave a comment wherever you saw it share it wherever you can this really helps us grow but I do appreciate you listening. Hopefully you found it useful. Definitely look forward to her next episode on how to get into a state of flow, which is really gonna help us as athletes understand, hey, what steps do I need to take so that when I start my training or when I start my matches, that I can get quicker to this state where I'm focused, I'm effective, and I'm producing results like I would like. And I want to announce that if anyone is interested in finding mentors in your sport, in other sports, in general as an athlete, to help you, guide you, educate you on better ways, how to make mistakes, learn from them, how to get over struggles, how to get through struggles, how to pivot when you need to pivot, how to plan in the future, how to goal set, how to do basically anything you should know how to do as an athlete, as a human, we're creating a mentorship group called Beyond Athletic Mentors. So go out to Facebook and check out forward slash Beyond Athletic Mentors, all one word together, and you should find us. Check out what it's about. Watch the intro video. If you're interested in participating in any way, shape or form, we'd love to have you. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, be more. What we do in life echoes in eternity. I'm going to show you how great I am. And this concludes our Chicago show. Please stay tuned.